everyone, and welcome to another Seed World Giant Views interview. My name is Alex Martin, and I'm the editor with Seed World Magazine. And today I'm joined by Andy Levine, who is president and CEO of the American Seed Trade Association, or ASTA. As we gear up for the ASTA CSS and Seed Expo in Chicago, the last one that's going to be in Chicago, Andy is joining us today to help us understand what's on ASTA members' minds as we near 2023. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I figured we could start with a, a kind of broad question. What have you and your team recently been working on at ASTA to try to better the lives of the, the USC professionals? Well, thanks, Alex. It's great to be with you today and appreciate the opportunity um, to participate in the Giants of the Seed Industry program. Um, uh, as I look at it, we've got so many giants in this industry, and it's always a challenge for me to be classified in that category. I, I just have such respect for this this industry sector and, and all the leaders that we have. So thanks for allowing me to be part of it. You know, when we look at these topics with ASTA in our, in our activities, they are completely member driven. And that's the base of what our association is. What are the issues that impact the, the membership and how do we do our best to address those where we can? You know, our, our activities are guided by our strategic plan. It's domestic policy, it's international activities, it's intellectual property rights, uh, communications, membership in internal matters, and our newest one is sustainability. And those really drive the policy activities and the expenditure of our resources, both financial and personnel. And so, you know, we have our ind individual issues and challenges as they, as they arise throughout the year, but we try to stay with those core pillars. You know, we deal with testing of seed and the movement of seed, both domestically and internationally, labeling issues, seed related matters that impact our, our members license to operate. So at the end of the day, um, we want to ensure that those companies can operate across the board, no matter their size or the sector that they're in, whether they're organic, conventional or biotechnology. And that means for us having a great relationship and working closely with state and federal government agencies state and federal uh, elected officials, our international counterparts, um, state and federal international policymakers to make sure that if, as they're developing policy, it doesn't negatively impact our industry and their capacity to um, work on that global or national basis. You know, and as an industry or industry association, we strive to remain forward looking and proactive. So always trying to look over that horizon and not in the rear view mirror and always keeping that long-term view in mind. You know, and lastly, as we challenge our membership and our board and officers leadership, you know, our discussions are focused on what's happening five years from now, what's happening 10 years from now. A lot of our activities are what's happening now to impact you and how do we actively uh, work to address those, but we can never lose that vision for long-term. How do we make sure that uh, the seed companies have that opportunity to continue to be successful? answer, Andy. Um, now, what have you seen on the minds of members lately? Have you heard any major concerns popping up in the industry that that's causing a, a, a bit of concern or unrest in the, the U.S. seed industry? Well, we could probably say there's a lot of them there, Alex, and that's a really great question. You know, as we come out of COVID and we're dealing with all of these issues of supply chain and other things, inflation, I think the inflation issues and the economy issues are core how is that going to impact our grower mem customers or grower uh, uh, partners in everything that we do? You know, we like to think about it as our companies are growers as well. They produce a crop. That crop happens to be seed. So just like a farmer, we have those same input costs of, uh, of producing that crop in order to get it to the farmer for the next season. And so we experience all of those same challenges of input costs, diesel costs, labor costs. And so how do we help to, to address those the best we can through the policies that uh, our, the federal government are trying to deal with? Um, other things, you know, with the movement of, of, of uh, our grain products afterward, we know we have issues with Mexico and we know we have issues with, with Europe and the war in Ukraine. They impact everything that our members do. And then on the ground here, we look at things like neonicotinoid use and seed treatments and, and um, you know, the opportunity to bring new breeding techniques into the marketplace without too much of a policy or regulatory burden and working closely with the Independent Professional Seed Association on the potential for generics and how do we get there, especially in the biotechnology space. 
Um, and then just that last one that we've been working on for, for a long time and one that I mentioned is there's incredible innovation going on in our industry. And how do we make sure that, that the industry is not hamstrung or handcuffed uh, in the ability to bring new innovation to the marketplace so that it's not limited to a few crops like we see in biotechnology. So plenty there on our plate. And I would say though, you know, in the, directly in front of us, it it's that inflation issues and the economy. Yeah, that, that is a lot of things on your plate, Andy. Um, I, I feel like we we should dive into to some of the, the regulatory atmosphere you're, you're facing right now. With midterm elections just behind us, what do you feel like the, the regulatory atmosphere is going to be for seed in 2023? Well, Alex, as we sit here in this, having this discussion two days after the election, I'm not sure the, the midterms are behind us yet. <laughs> We don't know what the makeup of the Congress is, but it's obvious that it's going to be a divided Congress, likely Republican House and in uh, Democratic Senate. But the Senate's probably going to be as close as it was last cycle, the last Congress. And the House, while it will be Republican, it'll be a lot closer than it was or that people anticipated. That always makes for even more acrimony, uh, lack of ability to work together. This administration is going to have to look at how they can work more closely to get some things done over the next two years with a Republican House and, and try to make sure we stay focused on what's important for the country, important for the economy, and important for our people. Uh, but you always have to keep in the back of your mind, Alex, that there's a presidential election in, in two years and the election's already started. That cycle is going to be tough and brutal over the next two years. And so through all of that noise, we have to make sure as we work on policy or legislation that we can continue to move that ball forward. You know the. the the economy has to continue to work. Agriculture has to continue to produce so that people can eat, so that we can keep you know, unrest globally down. And so there's a lot of factors there that while the noise gets really loud, we have to learn how to turn that down some. And the other thing is we're going to see a number of changes in Congress, new, new uh, representatives and new senators, and then a number of new ag committee uh, uh, members in both the House and the Senate. We've got a farm bill reauthorization coming up. It expires in 2023. So there's a lot that we have to be able to do to get the seed industry out in front of this Congress, out in front of this administration to make sure the policies that they pass in that farm bill will uh, be beneficial to the seed industry. Yeah, absolutely. I have another question, Andy, and it's about something you kind of already talked about a little bit in one of your answers. You talked about maintaining grain trade um, between different countries, and one of the countries you mentioned was, was Mexico. Um, I know Mexico recently announced that by 2024, they're hoping to phase out all GMO corn in the country. How have you seen that decision or how will that decision impact AFSTA members? I know we have a lot of corn guys out here in the U.S. who are going to be concerned. Yeah, Alex, that's really a, a quite a disappointing direction that President Obrador has taken with respect to GMO corn. They've been taking corn from the U.S. for for decades. And, and it's an important market for both of us. They need it. They can't produce enough for their livestock or for their, their food consumption. And, um, you know, the U.S. has it. We're, we're partners. We're neighbors. And it's an easy movement of, of uh, corn back and forth and soybeans, too. But uh, as they look at it here, he's focusing on GMO corn and use of Roundup. Um, you know, it's the number two market for America's corn growers. And you could just imagine the devastation that it would have economically on that 90 plus million acres of corn that's planted in, in the Midwest. Um, we believe it's a violation of the U.S., Mexico, Canada uh, trade agreement that was signed under the last administration. It's not based on any sound science policy. It's based on, uh, you know, just a popularity uh, a populist proposal from the president. Uh, it's it's interesting that uh, President Obrador's term is over in 2024. Uh, we heard from uh, one of the deputy ministers last week that they're going to try to start contracting for conventional seed or conventional corn production. Uh, it's not out there. We don't have the seed out there. So we don't know how they're going to get there. We are working closely with the U.S. government, with the Mexican government, our counterparts in Mexico and AMSAC to hopefully reach a conclusion here that is um, – dials down the noise a little bit in the heat and gets to where we can move into a, a more reasonable position because you look at the economic uh, nature of where we are globally and the impact on any country when you all of a sudden upset that movement of product like you would in this one, 
it would have a severe economic impact on the Mexican population. And because of that, uh, we really believe that the president needs to realize that potential impact on his people and uh, step back from that line and, and allow that movement to continue. Um, as more and more countries kind of look out, to, look to phase out certain seed technologies, how how should the U.S. be responding? I think you kind of elaborated on that a little bit with how you're responding to this decision from Mexico. But um, how else do you think we can respond? Well, you know, I th we think the, the Mexican decision is a bit of an anomaly compared to what we're seeing globally. You know, I, actually, we think there are a lot of places around the world that are starting to really look at seed in the discovery and innovations out there that are out there and start to change some of their positions. You know, Europe is looking at their biotech uh, regulations with respect to uh, breeding techniques and gene editing and trying to figure out innovation. And, and part of that is, I will purely admit, part of that is the pressure that they're getting because of the invasion of Ukraine and the, the impact on the movement of product that you, they relied on Ukraine for so long in Russia to some extent. Kenya just approved uh, some GMO products uh, as well as Ethiopia. So we're seeing improvement, approvals of, of GMO products globally. We look at how South American countries are looking at gene editing products. Several of those countries down there have already said gene editing uh, varieties are not GMOs. And so they're bringing, letting them into their marketplace. So that is another positive for us. We see a lot of adoption of seed treatments. There's some challenges there just from a regulatory standpoint, but we're working on that capacity building so people can uh, more um, uh, clearly adopt seed treatment policies in, in a lot of these countries, South America and Africa. And then biologicals coming into the marketplace are, are really exciting. So overall, yeah, we do have some of those anomalies that seem to grab our attention. But I think overall, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, folks seeing that seed innovation is the way to go to address a lot of the challenges that the marketplace are bringing on. And I'll bring up one other one. Uh, Alex, if you look at South, uh, the South African horn, um, a lot of that area was devastated a couple of years back by the um, fall armyworm. And in some place, some countries, they implemented emergency use of BT products uh, and it made a huge difference. And I think when they see that benefit of products like a BT trait in corn, it makes a huge impact on their ability to make change and the people accept it. So those examples are going to continue to be a big, big issue. And, and I think we're going to continue to see people adopting and accepting seed uh, technology and innovation. But that's fantastic news. I, I am glad to hear that it looks like those are just some outliers instead of some uh, precedents for the future. Um, then my final question for you to today, Andy, is I like to end with kind of a forward looking question. Um, with 2023 just a, a month or so away, what are you most looking forward to in the future with ASTA? Well, Alex, a couple of things. I know I just talked about Congress and the challenges that we're going to have there. But to me, I, I kind of cut my teeth in this political arena working on Capitol Hill. And every new Congress is exciting. It brings a whole new perspective. You've got a whole new bunch, batch of personalities, people who have objectives people who want to get things done or people who just want to stand there and try to stop everything. You know, you try to find those people who really uh, want to make a difference and they're reasonable and they're there for a purpose and you try to work with them to get our issues moved forward. And, and we always tend to find in the seed industry really good people to work with us. So we're, I look forward to that. I think it's going to be a great year to work with the new Congress and, and work with those new ideas. And it, it's always, it's an easy discussion for us, Alex, because you talk about the importance of seed and the fact that we're the base for the food system, both here in the U.S. and globally. So if you don't plant a seed, we don't eat. And the importance of that really resonates when you sit down and you just start the conversation with a new representative or a new senator and say, this is why it's important that we have policy on seed that uh, enables farmers to use the most, the most or the latest technologies and innovation. Farm Bill is always a, a, a vibrant time to be working on agriculture policy. We'll see what goes on there. Uh, a lot of dynamics already brewing in that, but it's important. It's important to have that safety net. It's important to have those research programs, and it's important to have those nutrition programs that, that uh, are the base of the Farm Bill as we go forward. And the last one I would say, um, 
uh, the ASTA board and I think the leadership within the seed industry have really made a commitment to building the next generation and our future leaders of the seed industry here in the U.S. You know, through our leadership summit, through other programs that, in this, that other associations put on, how do we develop those strategic partnerships to increase professional development, increase advocacy at the state level and the federal level and the international level? Uh, how do we really take that leadership role to help bring our, continue to bring our industry uh, leaders to a higher and higher level so that they are uh, that voice for the seed industry domestically? You know, we've got a great industry here and we want to continue to drive that long term vibrancy of, of the American seed industry. Perfect. No, I think that's a great way to wrap up our day, Andy. Thank you so much again. And um, thank you to everyone who listened to our interview. Make sure you stay tuned. We're going to have more interviews rolling out um, about the ASTA CSS and Seed Expo as it continues. So we'll see you soon. Thanks, Alex.